Hey there friends, it's Midnight Fears, back again to haunt your nights. Tonight on the agenda, True Night Shift Terrors. Get ready to be spooked. Two months ago, on a night cloaked in routine monotony, my reality twisted into a chilling enigma that refuses to leave me. I hesitate to share this tale, still shaken to the core, but silence feels like complicity. Working as a radio DJ has its perks odd hours, eclectic music, and the occasional bizarre caller. My domain was the graveyard shift at a local station in a sleepy coastal town, broadcasting to a handful of night owls and insomniacs. That night, the air was thick with fog, the kind that muffles sound and turns every streetlight into a hazy orb. Around 3 a.m., during a routine scan of frequencies, I stumbled upon something anomalous. It was a distress signal weak and crackling, but unmistakably urgent. The voice on the other end was hoarse, edged with panic. Mayday, 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 this is the SSS Lorelei. We are taking on water. Coordinates 41.40-338-2.1743. Immediate assistance required the coordinates puzzled me they led to a point several miles off the coast, where no ship should be at this hour. I reached for my coffee, my hand trembling, as the broadcast continued, detailing a rapid and catastrophic sinking. Grabbing my phone, I dialed the Coast Guard, my voice catching as I relayed the coordinates and the distressing message. The line crackled, and a disinterested operator informed me that no ships were registered in that area tonight, and perhaps it was a prank. I insisted, begged them to check, but the line went dead, swallowed by a static hiss that seemed to mock my growing dread. Returning to my broadcast equipment, I attempted to re-establish contact with the SS. The frequency was silent now, dead as the grave. A chill crawled up my spine as I sat back, defeated, staring into the swirling mist outside. The rest of my shift passed in a blur of unease, the music tracks playing to an audience that seemed suddenly sinister. Morning light did little to dispel my unease. News broke of a ship, the SS. Lorelei found capsized off the coast exactly at the coordinates given in the distress call. The ship had been reported missing only hours after I received the broadcast. It was impossible, inexplicable, yet undeniably real. In the days that followed, I visited the Coast Guard station, seeking answers. The operator remembered my frantic call, but shrugged off any suggestion that the timing was anything but a tragic coincidence. They had no records of a distress signal being received before the official report came in. Her sleep became elusive. Each night, as I manned the station, I kept the frequency open, half expecting the Lorelei's plea for help to crackle through again. It never did. Instead, there was a suffocating silence, the kind that presses against your ears and fills your lungs like water. Whispers around town spun tales of ghost ships and cursed waters, but none came close to explaining the desperate cries for help I had heard. I delved into records, uncovering stories of other mysterious disappearances in the same waters, each left without resolution or reason. The weight of the unknown bears down on me each night as I take to the airwaves, a constant reminder of the depths below and the voices swallowed by the sea. Whether a fluke of technology or a brush with the paranormal, the last broadcast of the SS, Lorelei remains etched in my memory, a chilling testament to the unseen horrors lurking in the dark, waiting just beyond the reach of the living. I'm not one to get spooked easily, but what's been happening at the hospital where I work as a janitor has shaken me. I need to tell someone about this, maybe just to make sense of it myself. It started about six weeks ago. I work the night shift, which is quiet, mostly just me and the empty hallways. My routine never changes mopping floors, changing trash bags, the usual. 
But then, at precisely 3.17 a.m. each night, something inexplicable began to occur. It was a Tuesday when I first noticed it. I was restocking supplies in a utility closet when I heard the distinct sound of a gurney rolling down the hallway. The wheels made that familiar squeak and rattle over the linoleum that I had become accustomed to. Thinking a nurse or doctor might need assistance, I quickly stepped out to offer help. No gurney, no people, just the steady hum of the fluorescent lights and the faint smell of antiseptic. I brushed it off as fatigue, a trick my mind played after too many hours in the quiet. But then it happened again the next night, and the night after that. Always at 3.17 a.m., always the same sound of wheels so vivid, so real. Each time I rushed out, only to find the hallway deserted. This routine turned into an obsession. I started timing my rounds to be in the hallway at 3.17 a.m., waiting to catch a glimpse of whoever or whatever was causing the noise. Night after night, the sound came. The hall remained stubbornly empty. I wasn't scared, not then. I was confused, curious. Things changed the night I brought my old camcorder to work, determined to record the sounds. Maybe the camera would catch something I missed. I set it up on a tripod at one end of the hall and waited. Like clockwork, the noise started, the sound of the gurney's wheels echoing off the walls. I stared down the length of the corridor, camera recording, heart pounding not a soul in sight. I played back the video, my hands shaking slightly. The audio picked up the sound clearly, but the video showed nothing. No gurney, no movement, nothing but the empty, sterile hallway. That was the moment the fear took hold, crawling into my mind, whispering doubts about my sanity. I did some digging into the hospital's past, hoping for an explanation. What I found was a chilling piece of history. Decades ago, there had been a tragic incident on the very floor I worked. A patient, due to be discharged after a successful surgery, had suddenly coded and died. The time of death in the old medical report? 3.17 a.m. I tried to dismiss it as coincidence, but the pieces fit together too neatly. Every night since, the sound of the gurney has seemed more desperate, more urgent. Last night, I thought I heard whispers, voices muted by distance, or perhaps unwillingness to be heard. I'm writing this now because something has to be done. I can't just listen anymore, I need to understand. Tonight, I plan to follow the sound, to see where it leads if it goes anywhere. Maybe tonight will be different. Maybe I'll see something. And if you're reading this, and it's been a while since I've said anything else about it, maybe I followed the sound a little too far. It was a Wednesday when I first noticed it two weeks ago, to be exact. I was wrapping up a call, the last of the evening, when I decided to turn off my monitor and pack up. As the screen went black, a reflection appeared momentarily in the glass. It was the figure of someone standing directly behind my chair. I spun around, heart leaping into my throat, but the space behind me was empty. I chalked it up to exhaustion or a trick of the light. But then it happened again the next night, and every night after that. Each time I turned off my monitor, the same reflection emerged an indistinct shape of a person, just standing there watching. I tested different scenarios, turning off nearby lights, adjusting the monitor's angle, even covering nearby windows, but nothing changed. The reflection was always there, subtly distinct yet unrecognizable. My rational mind struggled for a logical explanation. Perhaps it was residual stress, I thought, or maybe some odd refraction of the city's lights through the office windows. Still, the unshakable feeling of being watched began to gnaw at me. I started to dread those moments, 
the end of the night when I had to face the black mirror of my turned-off screen. Curiosity mixed with an escalating sense of dread led me to install a small webcam above my monitor, aimed to capture whatever stood behind me. I tested it during the day, ensuring it worked correctly, then left it running as the evening crawled into night. At 11.47 p.m., as per my new routine, I reached for the monitor's power button, heart pounding, and flicked it off. There, in the afterglow of the screen, the reflection appeared. I whipped around nothing. No presence, no movement, just the usual emptiness of the night shift office. I turned back to the computer and opened the webcam footage. The video showed me sitting there, then turning around, and... That was it. There was no figure, no movement in the background, nothing that could explain the reflection. I replayed the video, thinking I must have missed something. But it was undeniable the room was empty except for me. My mind raced for answers, but sleepless nights and the constant prickling sensation of unseen eyes wore me down. I began to feel a presence during the day not just at night. A cold spot directly behind my chair, a faint whisper of movement, as if someone sighed just over my shoulder. Then, two nights ago, something shifted. As I prepared to leave, I hesitated with my hand on the monitor. Drawing a deep breath, I turned off the screen and slowly, deliberately did not turn around. Instead, I watched the reflection intently, the figure was clearer this time, a man dressed in outdated clothing, his eyes hollow pools of darkness. He didn't move or speak, but his gaze bore into me, through the reflection, through the screen. A chill spread through my body, a deep, bone-deep cold that didn't lift when I flicked the lights on. I left the office that night feeling his eyes on me and haven't returned since. I work from home now avoiding the office and its nighttime silence. I've started seeing glimpses of shadows at home, but I tell myself it's just the stress, the lingering fear. Still, sometimes when my computer goes to sleep and the screen darkens, I feel a piercing gaze and I dare not look up to see my own reflection. Twenty eighteen, Darrow Public Library, Ohio. It was nearing midnight, another late shift that stretched into the empty hours of a Wednesday. The grand clock above the entrance had just chimed, its echo drifting through rows of shelves that resembled towering specters in the dim light. Here I was, the night librarian, assigned the thankless task of reshelving books a job that often left me alone with the creaks and groans of an old building settling into the dark. That night, something felt different. As I moved through the history section, a particular chill permeated the air, seeping through my sweater. The library's HVAC system was old and quirky, but this was a cold that felt like it came from the shelves themselves, as if the tragedies chronicled in the books had left a residual frost. I reached the section on tragic historical events, books heavy with the weight of wars, disasters, and atrocities. I was placing a book back on a shelf when I first heard it a whisper so soft it was nearly lost in the rustle of pages. Help me find them, the voice was faint, desperate. Startled, I looked around. No patrons stayed this late, and my colleagues were all stationed at the front desks or in the archival rooms on the other side of the building. I chalked it up to fatigue, my mind playing tricks after hours of monotonous work. But then it came again, clearer this time. The direction of the voice was unmistakable, it came from deeper within the tragic history section. My heart began to race, a primal part of me screaming to run, to escape the confines of these haunted aisles. But another part, perhaps the part that thrived on late nights amongst tales of the past, urged me forward. I followed the whispers, my steps hesitant. 
The air grew colder with each passing shelf. This way keep coming the voice coaxed now a mere few feet away. I stopped at a row, marked World Wars, the books here dusty and seldom touched. There, in the dim light, stood a figure. It was an old man, translucent, his edges blurring with the shadows around him. He was dressed in the garb of another era faded military uniform, medals tarnished by time. His eyes, desperate and hollow, met mine. I can't find them, he murmured, his voice a blend of anguish and urgency. The stories of my brothers lost in the wars. I can't rest, not until they're remembered. I didn't know how to react, my mind unable to grasp the reality of a ghost, a spirit anchored to the tragedies held within these pages. Yet there I stood, conversing with an apparition formed from the very sorrow that these books captured. What do you need I managed to ask, my voice barely above a whisper. Their stories, he replied, gesturing to the books around him. Help me find them, let them be known, not forgotten in the dust. Compelled by a mix of fear and compassion, I began to search through the titles, pulling out volumes of World War records, accounts of battles, lists of the fallen. Each book one handed to him seemed to ease a fraction of the pain etched into his spectral face. As dawn crept upon the horizon, the figure began to fade, his form dissolving into the morning light that filtered between the books. Thank you, he said, his voice now nothing but a breeze that fluttered pages. Then he was gone, leaving behind a lingering cold and an aisle of tragic histories that felt just a bit warmer. The next day, I returned to that section, but the chill was gone, replaced by a stillness that felt like peace. Whether anyone would believe this encounter, I didn't know, but in the silent rows of the Darrow Public Library, between the lines of forgotten wars and lost souls, I had found a whisper of truth in the quiet. Twenty nineteen, Crestview Corporate Center, Des Moines, Iowa. It's strange how a routine job can turn into a page from a horror story. Working as a security guard in an aging corporate building isn't exactly thrilling. Most nights, my biggest issue is staying awake until sunrise. But that all changed last March. It was just past midnight, and I was settling into my chair for another long night when I noticed something odd on one of the monitors. Every night at exactly midnight, the freight elevator descended to the basement. This wouldn't be unusual, except for one crucial detail the basement of Crestview had been sealed off for renovations five years ago after a structural fault was discovered. Since then, nobody had used it, or so I thought. At first I ignored it, chalking it up to a glitch in the system. Electrical malfunctions were common in this old building. But when it happened again the next night, and every night thereafter, curiosity overcame me. I decided to investigate. The elevator was an old, creaky thing, probably as old as the building itself. I rode it down to the basement level one night, heart pounding, half expecting it to plummet. When the doors opened, they revealed a long, dark hallway lit only by the faintest flicker of overhead lights, struggling against the years of disuse. The air was cool and musty, filled with the scent of damp concrete and mold. The silence was suffocating, every small sound echoing off the bare walls. I ventured down the hallway, flashlight in hand, the beam of light my only comfort. As I reached the end of the corridor, I noticed something that sent a chill down my spine. There was a door, slightly ajar, where no door should be. The building plan showed a solid wall at the end of this hallway. Tentatively, I pushed it open. The room beyond was unlike any other part of the basement. It was a small, square space, devoid of any features except for a single chair in the center, illuminated by a dim overhead bulb. 
On the chair lay a set of old, dusty security guard uniforms, much like the one I was wearing, but older in style. Suddenly, the light bulb flickered violently and went out, plunging the room into darkness. I heard the door slam shut behind me. Panic gripped me as I fumbled with the handle, but it wouldn't budge. My heart raced, and I could hear my own ragged breathing echoing in the pitch black. As if someone was murmuring secrets just out of reach. They grew louder, more insistent, swirling around me, pressing in. I couldn't make out the words, but the tone was pleading, desperate. I don't know how long I stood there, paralyzed with fear, before the door suddenly swung open on its own, the faint hallway light a blinding flood in the thick darkness. I stumbled out, not stopping to look back as I made my way to the elevator and ascended back to the ground floor. Back in the safety of the security office, I watched the monitors, heart still pounding in my chest. The elevator sat dormant at the basement level as if nothing had happened. I reported the malfunctioning elevator to maintenance, leaving out the part about the room and the whispers. They found no issues with the elevator and no explanation for its nightly journeys. I still work nights at Crestview, but I steer clear of the freight elevator. Sometimes at midnight I glance at the monitor and see the elevator descend to the basement its doors opening and closing on that forgotten floor. I try to convince myself it's just a glitch, but sometimes in the quiet of the night I can still hear faint whispers, like echoes of a nightmare I can't forget. Late Night Convenience, a small town on the outskirts of Nebraska. Every town has its stories, the kind that make you lock your doors at night and question the shadows. Working the graveyard shift at a 24-hour convenience store off a rarely traveled highway, you hear a lot of these, but nothing prepares you for when they happen to you. The pandemic was at its peak, streets emptier than usual, and it was the dead of winter. The nights were long, and the chill that seeped in through the convenience store's automatic doors was persistent. It must have been around 2 a.m. on a particularly silent Thursday when I first heard it a faint, distinct sound of an ice cream truck's melody. It was bizarre the melody was oddly distorted, slower than the cheerful tunes meant to attract kids. It seemed to loop just on the edge of hearing, creating an uneasy feeling. Curious, I stepped outside the first night I heard it, scanning the empty parking lot and the deserted highway. No truck, no kids, no movement that could justify the sound. I shrugged it off as lack of sleep, or maybe the wind playing tricks. But then it happened again. Every night, precisely at 2 a.m., that same twisted jingle, seeping out of the silent darkness. It started to get to me. My nights became about waiting for the music, the anticipation prickling my skin. I mentioned it to a few regulars, but they just joked about the ghost truck of Route 29. I tried to laugh along, but the unease settled deep. After a couple of weeks, I got obsessed with figuring it out. One night, armed with a flashlight in my phone ready to record, I decided to confront this phantom melody head-on. At 1.55 a.m., I stationed myself outside, the cold biting through my jacket. This time, it seemed louder, closer. I followed the sound walking along the side of the road, my flashlight beam dancing over frost-laden grass and barren trees. The music drew me to the adjacent field where the remnants of an old playground lay forgotten, swallowed by overgrowth. As I approached, the music grew overwhelming, drowning out the sound of my own breaths. There, amidst the skeletal remains of swings and a rusted slide, was the source. It was not an ice cream truck, but an old, battered music box, sitting on the seesaw. The paint was chipped and its design was faded, but every detail screamed that it didn't belong there. 
Tentatively, I reached out to stop it, to finally silence the haunting melody. But before my fingers could touch it, the music stopped abruptly on its own. The silence that followed was suffocating, a thick blanket thrown over the night sounds. I stood frozen, my breath visible in the air, when I heard a new sound soft but distinct. The laughter of children echoing around me, invisible and chilling. I didn't wait to shine my light around, I turned and ran back to the store, never looking back. The music box was gone the next day when I dared to check, the playground empty as if nothing had ever been amiss. But I know what I heard. I transferred to day shifts shortly after, unable to shake the chill that night left in my bones. I still work at the convenience store, but I never linger around past sunset. Some sounds are better left unexplored, some mysteries better left unsolved. The memory of that night lingers every time I hear an ice cream truck in the distance, a haunting melody that no longer sounds sweet. It was never just a bulb at least, that's what I came to believe during those endless night shifts at the Henderson Textiles Mill. The factory was an old relic from the 60s, with its peeling paint and a labyrinth of rusty machinery. I had been working there for what felt like forever, manning the graveyard shift, because the pay was decent and jobs were scarce in my small Kentucky town. One particular light, hanging over the central workbench, had developed a curious habit. It started around the time murmurs of layoffs began swirling, about six months ago. Every time I'd mutter about leaving finding something better, something less soul-crushing that light would flicker. At first it was just that, a flicker. But as weeks rolled into months, the flickering became more pronounced whenever the topic of quitting surfaced. You seeing this, I'd ask Joey, my only co-worker, during those ungodly hours. Yeah, it's just old wiring he'd dismiss never one to ponder the peculiarities around him. But I wasn't so sure. It felt like a signal, a warning. Each time I spoke of leaving, the light seemed to react as if it were tethered to my thoughts, my dissatisfaction. The intensity of its flickers increased gradually, culminating the night I announced to Joey that I'd had enough. I'm done, man. Tomorrow's my last day, I said, my voice echoing slightly in the vast, empty hall of machines. At that moment, the light didn't just flicker, it stuttered wildly, buzzing with what sounded like agitation. I stared at it, a cold shiver running down my spine. Joey noticed too, his usual dismissiveness replaced by a furrowed brow. That's weird, man, really weird, he muttered, his eyes fixed on the dancing bulb. The rest of the night passed with an unnerving quiet, the light stabilized, and I tried to convince myself it was indeed just faulty wiring, nothing more. I focused on my tasks, the familiar hum of machinery filling the space around me, trying not to think about the light. When my final shift ended, the first hints of dawn creeping through the grimy factory windows, I packed up my few belongings. I was ready to leave the eerie occurrences behind, eager for a fresh start. As I walked past the workbench for the last time, I glanced up at the light, half expecting it to give me a farewell flicker. Nothing. It remained steady, its dull, yellow glow constant. Exiting the building, the chilly morning air felt like liberation. I breathed deeply, the weight of years lifting off my shoulders. But as I reached my car and looked back at the factory one last time, a sudden chill gripped me. From inside, I could see the light through the window, and just like that, it went out, plunging the workbench into darkness. I drove away faster than I intended, unable to shake off the unease. Days turned into weeks, and life improved. I found a new job, the kind that didn't involve lonely nights or strange lights. But sometimes when the evening shadows grow long and the lights in my new place begin to dim, I think about that old factory. I wonder if the light ever came back on, or if it remained dark, waiting for someone else to ponder their escape. The experience left me with an unshakable feeling that some things, especially those lurking in the forgotten corners of old buildings, are better left undiscovered.
Nobody ever explained the rules of the night watch at the museum, but there were certain things you just you didn't bring food into the exhibits, you didn't take pictures, and most importantly, you never, ever touched the displays. I started working as a security guard at the Marston History Museum because it paid better than any other night job I could find, and all I had to do was walk around and make sure no one tried to steal a 3,000-year-old vase at 3 in the morning. The museum housed an extensive collection of artifacts from ancient civilizations, but it was the Egyptian exhibit that made me uneasy from the start. It wasn't just the dim lighting or the way the shadows played tricks on your eyes as you walked past rows of stone-faced statues and sarcophagi, it was something else, something inexplicable. I first noticed it my third week on the job. We did our rounds in pairs, and that night I was with Maggie, a veteran guard who knew every nook and cranny of the place. As we entered the Egyptian exhibit, I glanced at the statue of Anubis, the jackal-headed god, standing guard by the entrance. It was posed in the usual stance, staff in one hand, the other resting by its side. We made our round, nothing out of the ordinary, and returned through the same room to log our check. I stopped dead in my tracks. The statue, I could have sworn, was looking in a different direction. Its head, previously facing forward, now turned slightly towards the left, as if watching our movement. Wasn't that statue looking straight ahead before? She looked at me, eyebrows raised, then at the statue. It's been like that since they brought it in, she said, but her voice had an edge of doubt, right? Let's just finish up this place, gives me the creeps at night. I couldn't let it go. Night after night I watched. Some nights nothing changed, but on others I'd noticed small movements and arms slightly raised, a head tilted, a staff angled differently. I started taking notes, thinking my mind was playing tricks. But my log confirmed that the statue was moving, albeit subtly. Determined to understand what was happening, I set up a discreet video camera one evening, positioning it to get a clear view of Anubis. I told myself it was for peace of mind, that there'd be a logical explanation. When I reviewed the footage, my blood turned cold. At exactly 2.17 a.m., the statue's head began to turn, slowly, almost imperceptibly. Then the hand with the staff lowered, just a fraction, but enough to be noticeable. No one else was in the room, no drafts, no tremors, just the silent, deliberate movements of a statue that should not be able to move. I showed Maggie the footage the next day, and she went white as a sheet. We need to report this, she said, but I was hesitant. What would I say? That a 2,000-year-old statue was taking nightly strolls. We agreed to keep it between us, to observe a little longer. It was a week later when things escalated. During my round, I paused at the exhibit, a now nightly ritual, when I heard it a whisper, like sand sliding over stone. Chills raced down my spine as I turned slowly towards the source. Anubis's head was turned, not just slightly, but completely, facing me directly. Its eyes, which I knew were just carved stone, bore into me and I heard it again, a whisper, echoing around the cavernous room watcher. I didn't wait around. I left the room, left my shift early, and didn't return. I called Maggie to explain, and she didn't blame me for walking away. She quit a week later. Sometimes I pass by the museum during the day, the sun bright and people laughing as they walk in and out. But I keep walking. Some things are better left undisturbed, and some jobs, well, they just aren't worth the paycheck. It started as just another quirk of the job. Running the late shift at Mel's Diner in a sleepy part of New Mexico meant dealing with all sorts of characters, but none left quite the impression as the man in the 1950s outfit. He first appeared on a cool September night, just as I was about to flip the sign to closed. He walked in with the swagger of someone who'd stepped right out of a classic film press trousers, a crisp white shirt, and a fedora hat shadowing his eyes. The diner, with its checkered floors and jukebox tunes, seemed to welcome him as if he belonged to its era more than to the present day. He slid into a booth by the window, his back to the road, and glanced up just once to catch my eye. Coffee, please. He said, his voice smooth, the kind that's used to being listened to. I nodded, thinking he was just another customer, albeit dressed for a costume party perhaps, and went to brew a fresh pot. When I returned with his order, the coffee steaming gently, he was gone. The booth was empty, no sign of disturbance. 
The seat was still tucked neatly under the table, and the air hung with a chill that hadn't been there before. I looked around, puzzled, wondering if I'd imagined him, but the other few customers were still lingering over their late meals, oblivious. This became his routine. Every few nights, always just before closing, he'd appear. Each time, he ordered black coffee, and each time, he vanished before I could bring it to him. It wasn't just his disappearance that unsettled me, it was the way the air turned cold each time he entered, how the jukebox would hiccup or falter whenever he walked through the door. Curiosity and a bit of fear drove me to dig a little deeper. I asked around, described the man to old-timers in the town, hoping someone else had seen him. No one had, but they did tell me stories of the original Mel's Diner, one that had burned down in the late 50s, just a few blocks from where the new diner stood. It had been a local hotspot they said, until a tragic fire during a Halloween party claimed several lives. Armed with this history, I felt a chill that went deeper than the cold snaps when he entered. The next time he came in, I was ready. I brewed the coffee as he sat down and watched him closely. He seemed unperturbed, lost in thought, staring out the window as if waiting for something, or someone, from long ago. Determined to catch him before he could disappear, I approached with the coffee but stopped short when I saw his face in the light. It was worn more than when he had first walked in, marked with sadness and a longing that was almost palpable. His eyes met mine and there was a flicker of recognition, or maybe acknowledgement, that I had pieced together his story. His lips twitched into a sad smile and he glanced at the seat opposite him, as if he could see someone there that I couldn't. My wife, he finally said, his voice a whisper of smoke and memories. She never made it out of the fire. Before I could respond, before I could blink, he was gone. The coffee cup sat steaming on the table, the only proof he had been there at all. I reached out, touched the porcelain. It was icy cold. From that night on, he never returned. The diner felt warmer, somehow more solid, as if his story had been waiting to be told, to be heard, to be acknowledged. I still work the late shift, and sometimes, when the wind is just right, I swear I can hear the faint strains of a 50s love song playing, drifting out from the shadows of the past. Driving a bus late at night gives you a sort of sixth sense. You begin to predict who will get off where, who's just riding to stay warm, and who's lost but nothing in my years behind the wheel prepared me for the night I met the lost driver. It was a routine Thursday, the bus mostly empty, except for a few regulars napping in the back. The clock had just blinked past midnight when he boarded. He was an older man, dressed in a dusty black coat, his hair more salt than pepper. He moved with an unsettling purpose as he approached, dropping exact change into the fare box without taking his eyes off the road ahead. In the evening I nodded, but he didn't respond, just clutched the pole next to my seat, as if bracing for a storm. Where to tonight, I asked as we rolled away from the stop. He finally turned, his eyes sharp, cutting through the dim light of the bus. Miller's farm, he said, voice firm but distant, like a memory fading out of reach. I hesitated, the name tugging at something in my mind. The place had been a local hangout when I was a kid but it hadn't existed for years, not since the big fire that left nothing but charred timbers and a cautionary tale about trespassing on old properties. That place isn't around anymore, I told him, thinking he might be confused, maybe suffering from dementia, burned down ages ago. He insisted, though, giving me turn-by-turn -turn directions with confidence. His certainty unnerved me, but curiosity got the better of my judgment. I figured I'd drive by the old location, show him the empty field that was left, maybe jog his memory or help him realize his mistake. The night was unusually quiet as we drove, the other passengers long gone, leaving just the two of us in a cocoon of streetlight shadows and engine hum. As we neared the destination, the old man's directions grew more fervent. Just around this bend he pointed, then left by the old oak tree. Every landmark he named was spot on a ghost of the landscape I remembered as a child. And then, there it was, the clearing where Miller's farm once stood. But instead of an empty field, the dim outlines of a structure loomed in the darkness, its presence an eerie silhouette against the night sky. I slowed the bus, heart thudding in disbelief. The building shouldn't be there, yet there it stood, as if it had never burned down at all. 
I stopped the bus, turning to ask the old man what this meant, but the seat was empty. He was gone without a sound, without a trace, leaving behind only the echo of the door, never opening. Chills raced down my spine as I stared out at the phantom farmhouse, its windows dark and hollow. I didn't stay long. The air felt too thick, too charged with an energy I couldn't explain. I drove back to the depot with the windows down, trying to shake off the cold that had settled deep in my bones. I reported the incident to my supervisor, who laughed it off as fatigue, a driver's imagination running wild at the end of a long shift. But I know what I saw, both the man and the impossible house. I've driven that route every night since, and not once has the farmhouse appeared again. It was as though that night the past had reached out through the veil of time, asking to be remembered or warning to be left alone. Now, when I pass that empty field, I can't help but watch the shadows, half expecting to see the old man waiting for a ride back to a place that no longer exists. But he never appears, and the field remains just a field, under the watchful eyes of someone who now knows better than to trust the quiet. The overnight shift at Murphy's supermarket was generally uneventful. As a night stalker, my job was to refill shelves emptied during the day and get the store ready for the next rush of customers. The work was repetitive, almost meditative, and the quiet of the store after hours was something I'd come to enjoy. That is, until one winter night when the quiet was shattered by the unmistakable sound of a child crying. It started just after 2 a.m. I was restocking the cereal aisle, the kind where the boxes are bright and colorful, aimed at catching kids' eyes. The sobbing was soft at first, almost drowned out by the hum of the freezers from the next section over. I paused, box in hand, listening. The sound was coming from a few aisles down, near the toys and kids' clothing. Thinking some kid had been accidentally locked in, or a prank was being played, I set the box down and headed toward the noise. The cries grew louder as I approached, desperate and scared. It's a heart-wrenching sound, a child's cry, and it quickened my pace. But as soon as I turned into the aisle, the crying stopped. I flicked on the lights, usually kept dim to save power overnight, but the aisle was empty. No child, no signs of anyone. The stuffed animals and superhero action figures stared back at me, silent witnesses to nothing. Puzzled, I checked the surrounding aisles, even peeked into the bathrooms anywhere a kid might hide. Finding nothing, I returned to my duties, chalking it up to my imagination, or perhaps the building settling. Yet no sooner had I resumed stacking cereal boxes than the crying began again, louder, more urgent. The cycle repeated throughout the night cries, leading me on a fruitless search, only to cease the moment I approached their source. The store was supposed to be empty, all doors locked, all customers gone. The more it happened, the more unnerved I became. It didn't make sense. Exhaustion, maybe, was playing tricks on my mind. That's what I tried to convince myself, at least until I mentioned it offhand to Eddie, one of the older employees, the next night. When I told him he paused, a look of recognition, or was it fear? Flickering across his face, he leaned in close, lowering his voice. You heard it too. Ha, uh, he glanced around before continuing. Been happening for years, ever since that accident. What accident, I asked, a chill running down my spine despite the store's heating. About five years back. Eddie explained, right before Christmas, a shelf in the toy aisle collapsed. One of the displays was set up too high, unstable. A little boy, must have been about three or four, was climbing on the lower shelves, trying to reach a toy. The whole thing came down on him. He, he didn't make it. The air felt heavy, thick with unspoken thoughts. They say he's still here, Eddie continued, his voice barely a whisper, looking for that toy, crying because he can't find it, or won't find it. I didn't know what to make of Eddie's story. Part of me refused to believe it, clinging to rational explanations. Yet, night after night, the crying continued, always starting and stopping in the same pattern. No matter how many times I investigated, no matter how quickly I reacted, I never caught sight of anyone. The aisles remained stubbornly empty, the air suddenly still where there should have been a child. I tried to ignore it, focus on my work, keep my music louder in my earbuds. But sometimes, in the quiet moments when a song ended, or when I needed to replace a battery, I'd hear at the faint, distant sound of a child sobbing. 
as real as anything I'd ever heard. Eventually, I couldn't take it anymore. The eerie cries, the empty aisles, the feeling of being watched, it all became too much. I quit not long after, found a daytime job where the sunlight could wash away the shadows of doubt that had begun to linger in my mind. Sometimes, though, late at night, when the world is quiet, I wonder about that little boy. Is he still there, wandering the aisles, searching for a toy just out of reach? I hope not. I hope he's found whatever he's looking for. But deep down, I know some mysteries don't have happy endings, especially not in the dead of night at Murphy's supermarket. This tale is true, and I feel its echoes still. Every detail etched in my mind, vivid as if it happened just yesterday, yet it's been nearly two years since those unnerving events unfolded. Back then, I was working as a security guard at the Grenville Corporate Towers, a gleaming set of skyscrapers that cut sharp silhouettes against the city's skyline. My role involved the usual patrolling the premises, checking in visitors, and monitoring the CCTV feeds, which is how I first encountered the anomaly. It was a routine overnight shift, the kind where the silence is so thick you could slice it with a knife. Most of the building's occupants had long since departed, leaving their fluorescent lit offices to hum quietly in the dark. That night, as I scanned through the security feeds, my eyes caught a startling sight on one of the rooftop cameras. A shadowy figure stood at the edge of the building's roof. The silhouette was distinctly human, unmoving, just staring out over the city. I blinked thinking my eyes must be playing tricks on me. But when I looked again, the figure was still there, an inky blot against the moonlit rooftop. Concerned, I grabbed my radio and flashlight, heading for the roof to confront what I assumed was a trespasser, perhaps a thrill-seeker, or a lost soul seeking solace in dangerous solitude. By the time I reached the roof, my breath was heavy, clouds of it visible in the cold night air. I swung the door open, stepping out onto the rooftop. It was empty. No footprints disturbed the thin layer of frost that coated the concrete, no signs of human presence at all. Confused, I radioed down to the control room, asking them to verify the figure's presence on the CCTV. It still there came the reply, a hint of unease in the operator's voice. I glanced around, the beam of my flashlight slicing through the darkness, but there was nothing, nobody, just the hum of the city below and the whisper of the wind. I headed back to the control room, my mind racing with possibilities. When I arrived, my colleague pointed to the screen. There, as clear as day, was the shadowy figure, still perched at the edge of the roof. We called the police, unsure of what to make of the situation. While we waited for them to arrive, we kept our eyes glued to the monitor. Then, without warning, the figure leaped off the building. My heart stopped. The camera captured the entire fall, but when it reached the ground level, nothing. No body, no impact, nothing disturbed. It was as if the figure had vanished into thin air. The police conducted a thorough search, inside and out, but found no evidence of anyone having been on the roof or any indication of a jump. They suggested it might be a glitch in the system, a shadow thrown by something else. But I had seen it with my own eyes. It was no glitch. The next few nights were tense. The figure appeared several more times, always at the same spot, always at the same time. Each occurrence ended the same way with the phantom leap off the building, disappearing before it ever hit the ground. I tried everything to explain it, adjusting the cameras, setting up additional lighting, even spending entire shifts on the roof. Nothing revealed any clues. The building management eventually called in specialists to examine the CCTV system, but they found nothing wrong, no malfunctions, no explanations for what we'd seen. The sighting stopped as mysteriously as they had started, leaving more questions than answers. I left the job not long after. The stress of those nights, the feeling of something unseen and unexplained watching, waiting it became too much. Sometimes I pass by the Grenville Towers and look up at the roof, half expecting to see that shadowy figure staring back down at me. But there's nothing there, just the memories of those chilling encounters. I can't explain what happened or why. Maybe some things aren't meant to be understood, but I know what I saw and it haunts me still. That image of the figure jumping, the helplessness of watching something I couldn't stop or explain it's a weight I'll carry always, a reminder of the night when the shadows themselves seem to come alive.
In the spring of 2017, I was working as a park ranger at Redwood National Park, a sprawling expanse of ancient forests and rugged coastline in Northern California. My duties often involved night patrols, ensuring campers were safe and rule-abiding, and that the park's wildlife was undisturbed by poachers. The stillness of those woods at night was usually peaceful, a solitude I'd come to cherish. But one night, everything changed when the woods began to whisper. It started as a routine patrol. The moon was bright, casting long shadows through the towering trees, and a light fog was rolling in off the ocean. As I was walking through a particularly dense part of the forest, I paused to check my map. That's when I first heard it a soft, indistinct murmur, like the sound of distant conversation. I turned off my flashlight, thinking perhaps some campers were having a fireside chat nearby. But the whispering didn't cease, it grew louder, clearer. I could almost make out words, but not quite. It seemed as if the forest itself was speaking in hushed tones. Intrigued and unnerved, I followed the sounds deeper into the woods. The terrain became rougher, the familiar paths gave way to underbrush and thick ferns, and the whispering became more insistent, urging me forward. I should have felt scared, but instead, I was drawn in by a need to understand. After what felt like miles, I reached a clearing I had never encountered before. It was a small, circular area where no trees grew, only a patch of wild grass, and in the center, a mound of earth marked by stones, an unmarked grave, unmistakable and out of place. The whispers then halted abruptly, leaving a heavy silence hanging in the air. I approached the grave, my heart pounding not with fear, but with a profound sadness. It was as though the air around it was thick with grief, the remnants of a long-forgotten tragedy. I stood there for what felt like hours, lost in a sea of emotion that wasn't my own. The moon cast its pale light over the grave, and for a moment, it felt like the world was holding its breath. The silence was broken by a single word, whispered so softly. It was almost lost in the wind. Finally, it was a voice filled with relief, as if a long-held breath had been let go. I looked around, half expecting someone to be standing beside me, but there was only the empty night. I left the clearing and made my way back to the ranger station, the whispers now silent, the forest around me no longer just a place of natural beauty, but a holder of secrets. I reported my findings the next day, and a subsequent investigation uncovered that the grave belonged to a young woman who had gone missing in the park in the early 1900s. Her disappearance had been a local mystery, her story forgotten by time. In the weeks that followed, I visited the grave often, clearing away the weeds and laying wildflowers. The whispers never returned, but the feeling of being watched over by the forest remained. I like to think that the whispers were the forest's way of looking after its own, guiding me to help bring peace to a restless soul. Now, when I walk the night patrol, I listen more closely to the sounds of the woods, respectful of the voices of the past that might still linger in the whispering leaves. The forest is alive in ways I had never imagined, and I've learned that every whisper, every rustle of leaves, has a story to tell. It was 2019, and I'd been employed for a few months at Halverson Tate, a mid-sized public relations firm based in San Diego. My job often demanded long hours, well into the night, especially when we were prepping for big client pitches. It was during one of these late nights that I first noticed something odd with the notes I was taking. I had a habit of jotting down everything in blue ink ideas, to-do lists, reminders. It made the constant swirl of information easier to manage. One night, after sketching out some key points for a new campaign, I left them on my desk, went home, and thought nothing more of it. But when I arrived the next morning, the paper was blank. It was as if I had never written anything. I figured I must have misplaced the original and simply written a new list, chalking it up to the late hours in my own disorganization. However, when the same thing happened, several days in a row notes written the night before vanishing by morning, I began to worry. Was I losing my mind under too much stress? To test it, I started taking photos of my notes each night with my phone. Sure enough, the next morning, the paper would be blank, but the words were clear as day in the photos. Perplexed and seeking an explanation, I mentioned this casually to one of my co-workers, expecting a laugh or a logical explanation about the type of ink I was using or the paper's quality. Instead, her face went pale. 
She glanced around before leaning in, whispering that I wasn't the first to experience strange occurrences, especially when working late. Others had heard inexplicable noises, seen fleeting shadows, and encountered cold spots, but no one wanted to talk openly about it. The office had a history, she said, something about an unhappy past, though details were vague. Determined to get to the bottom of this, I set up a small camera to record my desk overnight. What I captured chilled me to the bone. At around 2.17 a.m., the footage showed the pages of my notebook fluttering, as though caught in a breeze, though the windows were closed and the air conditioning off. As the pages settled, the ink began to fade from the paper, disappearing right before the camera's unblinking eye. Days later, the notes reappeared. This time, however, there were additional messages scrawled across the pages in a tight, jagged script. Nothing like my neat handwriting. Help me read one. Don't ignore pleaded another. Each message was more desperate than the last, the ink darker and more forceful. Fear gripped me, but so did a relentless need for answers. I stayed late again, sitting vigilantly by my desk, till past midnight, the atmosphere thick with an unspoken dread. Nothing unusual happened until I started packing up to leave. Just as I stood up, a cold gust swept through the room, papers scattering in its wake. And there it was on my desk, a new note, ink still glistening. Thank you for seeing me at red. After that night, the disappearances stopped. My notes remained as I left them, the strange messages ceased, and the office felt inexplicably lighter. Some co-workers speculated that acknowledging the presence, whatever it might have been, had given it the peace it needed. I still work at Halverson Tate, though I rarely stay late anymore. When I do, I make sure to leave a note out, a simple you're not forgotten just in case. The past, I've learned, doesn't always stay where it belongs, and sometimes it just needs to be heard. Every night shift has its rhythm, a predictable pattern of checks and charts, with just enough silence in between for your mind to wander into the dimly lit hallways of the Cedar Grove nursing home. That is until I started seeing her a figure all in white, a contrast against the shadows that clung to the corners of the quarters. It was during the winter of 2021, a particularly harsh one where the nights seemed to stretch longer than the days when I first noticed her. It was around 3 a.m., a time when the world seems to hold its breath and the distant hum of medical equipment blends with the whistling wind outside. As I stepped out of Mrs. Henderson's room, having made sure she was sleeping soundly, I saw a figure at the end of the hall. She was an elderly woman wearing what looked like an old-fashioned nurse's uniform, white and pristine. Her hair was pulled back tightly, and she moved with a purpose, her steps silent on the tiled floor. Thinking it was a resident who had managed to wander out of bed, I called out softly, not wanting to startle her. Ma M, can I help you back to your room? She didn't respond, just continued walking, her figure slowly fading as she passed into the darkness towards the stairwell. I hurried after her, my heart beginning to race not with fear, but with the concern of a nurse who needed to ensure her patient's safety. But when I reached the stairwell, it was empty. No sign of her anywhere. I checked every possible room she could have entered, but there was nothing. Every patient was accounted for, sleeping soundly. I brushed it off as a trick of the light, or perhaps fatigue, playing tricks on my eyes after so many hours on my feet. Yet, night after night, I saw her again. Always at 3 a.m., always walking down the hallway towards the stairwell, always disappearing before I could reach her. I started to ask around, half expecting my colleagues to laugh or roll their eyes. But what I found was not mockery, but recognition. Others had seen her, too. Some said she was a patient who had died years ago in the very room Mrs. Henderson now occupied. Others thought she might be a former nurse connected to the old part of the building, which had once served as a hospice during the early 20th century. Determined to get to the bottom of it, I did some research into the history of Cedar Grove. It turned out that it was originally built as a sanatorium in the 1920s, where many patients succumbed to tuberculosis. Among the records was a mention of a nurse, Mary Whitlock, who had dedicated her life to caring for the terminally ill, only to fall victim to the disease herself. Her description matched the woman I had seen, always in her nurse's uniform, caring for her patients until her final days. Armed with this knowledge, I felt a mix of fear and sadness during my subsequent encounters. When she appeared again, instead of following, I stood and watched. 
She turned slightly, as if aware of my presence for the first time, and in that brief moment before she vanished, I thought I saw a smile, a look of gratitude for recognizing her continued dedication, even in death. The sightings grew less frequent after that night, perhaps acknowledging her story was what she needed, or maybe I had grown too used to her presence to notice any more. But one thing is certain in the quiet moments of my night shifts, when the cold seeps in and the world outside falls silent, I feel a certain comfort knowing that maybe, just maybe, Mary Whitlock is still roaming the halls, ensuring that all is as it should be, I'm watching over her charges with the same dedication she had in life. It was a routine haul, nothing out of the ordinary as I climbed into my truck that evening in March. The destination was a familiar one, a straight shot from Cleveland to Pittsburgh. The roads were clear and traffic was light, conditions perfect for making good time. However, what started as an average night quickly turned into one of the most unsettling experiences of my life. Around midnight, I approached a stretch of highway that runs through a wooded area known locally for being misty, at times due to the nearby rivers. But the fog I encountered that night was unlike any I had seen before. It rolled in suddenly, a thick, opaque wall of white that swallowed up the beams of my headlights and blanketed the road in silence. Within minutes, visibility was down to a few feet in front of the bumper, and I had no choice but to reduce speed to a crawl. As the fog enveloped the truck, a chill crept into the cabin that the heater couldn't dispel. I remember glancing at the clock on the dash as the fog began to thicken at red 12.03 a.m. Figuring I'd be out of the fog in no time, I focused on the white lines barely visible on the road, guiding my way. But as minutes turned into what felt like hours, the fog didn't let up. It clung to everything, dense and unyielding. At some point, a realization dawned on me that sent a shiver down my spine despite what felt like a long time driving at a snail's pace through this fog. The clock still read 12.03 a.m. It hadn't advanced a minute. I tapped the glass, thinking it must be broken, but it remained stubbornly fixed. My phone, which I tried next, showed the same time, frozen. Every electronic device in the truck was locked at 12.03 a.m., panic began to set in. The road was familiar, one I'd driven a hundred times, yet nothing about this felt right. The usual landmarks were absent, hidden by the fog, and the silence was oppressive, the only sound the steady hum of the engine and the tires slowly crunching along the pavement. It felt as though I had driven into another world, a place unstuck in time. Then the radio, which had been playing softly, cut to static. Through the crackle and hiss, a voice emerged, faint and distorted. It wasn't speaking to me, not really it sounded like a conversation, snippets of words and laughter, as if from a distant party or gathering. But every attempt to change the station only brought more static, until the voices faded away as mysteriously as they had appeared. Hours seemed to pass in that timeless fog. I felt a growing sense of dread, a fear that maybe I wouldn't ever emerge from this white void. Just as I began to despair, questioning whether I should stop and wait for daylight or something to change, the fog began to thin. Gradually, the darkness of the night reasserted itself, and the familiar orange glow of a highway streetlight pierced through the haze. The clock suddenly jumped to 3.17 a.m., blinking back to life, as if no time had stopped at all, the night reclaiming the lost hours. I was close to Pittsburgh, far beyond where I should have been if time had truly stood still. But pulling over at the first opportunity, I tried to collect myself. My hands were shaking, and my mind raced to make sense of what had happened. I've driven that route many times since, always half expecting, or perhaps half hoping the fog would return, giving me a chance to understand what happened that night. But it never has. Whatever strange fold in time or trick of the mind I experienced, it remains a singular event, a story that sounds too bizarre to be true, yet one I cannot forget. The subway is a place where the roar of trains and the chatter of passengers create a symphony of urban life. It's alive, always moving. But in the depths of night, when the last of the stragglers filter out and the fluorescent lights buzz overhead with a morose flicker, the station transforms into something else entirely. 
This is when I would do my rounds, making sure everything was shut down and secure for the night. It was a routine job, a bit eerie at times, but nothing I couldn't handle. That was until one particular night, when the echoes of the past came rolling down an abandoned track. It was a cold February night, the kind where the chill seeps into your bones, and every sound in the empty subway tunnels seems amplified. I was walking along the platform of the lower level, which hadn't been used for passenger service in years due to structural concerns. It was supposed to be deserted, a relic of the past waiting for renovations that the city budget kept putting off. The only sounds were my footsteps and the distant dripping of water. Suddenly, a distant rumble broke the silence. It was faint at first, easy to dismiss as the wind or maybe my imagination, but then it grew louder, the unmistakable sound of a train approaching. I stopped dead in my tracks, my heart racing. There was no scheduled train on this line, not anymore. The control center had confirmed all clear before I started my rounds. I reached for my radio to report the incident, but paused when another sound layered over the rumble of the train a cacophony of laughter and music, like a party in full swing. The sounds were old-timey, like something out of the 1920s or 1930s, complete with a brass band and the clinking of glasses. I felt a chill run down my spine that had nothing to do with the cold. The platform lights flickered as the sounds grew louder, and through the darkness of the tunnel, I saw the headlight of a train piercing the gloom. It was an old model, the kind you see in black and white photos, not the sleek, modern trains that ran through the rest of the system. It slowed as it approached, the music and laughter echoing off the walls, creating an eerie resonance. I pressed myself against the wall, unsure of what was happening. Was this a prank? Hallucination? The train came to a stop with a screech of metal on metal, its doors opening to reveal a crowd of people dressed in period attire, laughing and talking as if at a gala event. They didn't seem to notice me, and in a blink the doors closed, and the train started up again, moving past me and vanishing into the tunnel on the other side. Once it was gone, the platform was silent again, as if nothing had happened. I finally managed to call the control center, my voice shaking. They insisted there was no train, that it was impossible for what I described to have occurred. No trains were scheduled or missing, and all tracks were accounted for. I couldn't shake what I had seen and heard, so I started doing some research into the history of the subway station. I discovered that, during the late 1920s, it was indeed a bustling hub, known for its underground speakeasies and jazz clubs, hidden away from the Prohibition-era restrictions above. It was rumored that a tragic accident had occurred, where a train derailed, leading to several deaths. The details were murky, lost to time, but the echoes of that night seemed to live on. To this day, I can't explain what I witnessed. Some nights, when the air grows cold and the station is quiet, I think I hear faint echoes of laughter and music drifting up from the abandoned track. Whether it's the wind, a trick of the acoustics, or something else, I can't say. But I do know that the subway, for all its noise and bustle, holds secrets in its shadows, echoes of its past, that occasionally ripple into the present. Working late in a high-rise always felt eerie, especially since the building was practically deserted after 8 p.m. The giant maze of cubicles transformed into silent, shadowy caverns after hours, and the echoing emptiness of the lobby was like something straight out of a movie scene. But I chalked up any unease to an overactive imagination. That was until the night I encountered the phantom floor. It was a particularly long day. I was working on a major project with a deadline looming and my focus had me clocking out much later than usual. The clock neared midnight when I finally packed up to leave. As I made my way to the elevators, the empty office behind me seemed to absorb every sound except for the soft tap of my shoes on the polished marble floor. I pressed the down button and waited. The digital display above the elevator doors ticked off the floors as the car descended towards me minus 15, 14, 13. Suddenly it stopped on 13 and lingered there. I remember frowning, puzzled. The building didn't have a 13th floor. Superstitious architects had omitted it from the original plans the elevator should have gone from 14 straight to 12. I always thought that was funny, like skipping a number could somehow stave off bad luck. The elevator doors slid open, and for a moment I was too taken aback to move. Warm, 
Golden light spilled into the hall, and the sound of laughter and clinking glasses filled the air. It was as though the doors had opened to a lively party. I could see people inside, dressed in what appeared to be vintage 1920s attire, mingling with drinks in hand. A woman in a flapper dress caught my eye and smiled, beckoning me to join. But as I stepped forward, driven by a mix of incredulity and curiosity, the doors abruptly shut, and the display blinked before resuming its descent to the ground floor. I stood there, heart pounding, staring at the metal doors, now reflecting only my confused expression. When the elevator reached the lobby, I stepped out, my mind racing. The night guard, seeing my pale face, asked if I was all right. I just nodded, not sure how to explain what had happened without sounding unhinged. That night I went home and did some digging into the building's history. Turns out the site where the high-rise now stood used to be a grand hotel in the early 1900s, famous for its lavish parties and notable guests. It was demolished after a devastating fire in 1923, a tragedy that claimed many lives during one of its galas. The current building was erected over the old hotel grounds, and stories of hauntings had circulated among the staff for years, though I'd always dismissed them as urban legends. When the next day, and many days after, I tried to replicate the occurrence. I stayed late again, riding the elevators at the same time, but nothing out of the ordinary happened. The elevator passed from the 14th floor to the 12th without pause, the 13th floor remaining the building's little architectural joke. But I know what I saw and heard wasn't a trick of isolation or fatigue. Sometimes, late at night, when the world is quiet and the barriers of reality perhaps thin a little, the past bleeds into the present. I can't help but wonder if, just for a moment, I caught a glimpse of the old hotel's ghost, reliving its final night of revelry and disaster on what should have been an ordinary ride down the elevator. The summer of 2018 marked my first year working at the old Meridian Hotel, situated in a small coastal town that saw its fair share of tourists during the high season. Once the bustle of the day subsided, the night shift often left me alone in the lobby, attending to the occasional late check-in or dealing with guest requests. The hotel, built in the 1920s, had its quirks, from squeaky floorboards to a slightly unreliable elevator but it was room 404 that eventually came to hold my deepest apprehensions. My shift started as usual at 11 p.m. By midnight, the lobby was quiet, with most guests retired to their rooms. That's when the phone rang for the first time. Glancing at the display, I saw it was an internal call from room 404. I answered it, expecting to hear a guest's request for extra towels or a late night snack. Instead, there was a brief moment of static before a voice, distinctly agitated, came through. You need to do something about the noise, the voice said, a man's voice, strained with annoyance. It's unbearable. I apologized and promised to look into it, although the hotel was particularly quiet that night. I checked our system room 404 was marked as unoccupied. Curious, I decided to go up there myself. The hallway was dimly lit, the air stale with a musty smell that seemed to cling to the old carpet. As I approached room 404, the silence was palpable. I knocked, half expecting an answer, but there was none. Using the master key, I opened the door to an empty room, untouched and perfectly made up for the next guest. A shiver ran down my spine, but I chalked it up to the air conditioning and an overactive imagination. Returning to the desk, I wrote it off as a glitch in the phone system, or perhaps a prank by some bored teenagers staying in the hotel. But the next night it happened again, the same room, the same complaint. This time the voice sounded more desperate. Please, can't you hear that? It's like walls are thinning again. I found room 404 empty. The calls became a nightly occurrence, always around the same time, just past midnight. Each time the voice grew more distressed, more pleading. I reported the issue to my manager, who was as baffled as I was. We checked the phone lines, had our maintenance crew go over the room, even investigated if someone was somehow accessing the room without our knowledge. Nothing came up. Finally, one night, driven by a mix of fear and frustration, I decided to wait in room 404 during the time of the call. As the clock neared midnight, I sat on the dusty armchair by the phone, my heart pounding in the silence. The minutes ticked by slowly, the tension in the air thickening. 
Then, the phone rang, startling me despite my anticipation. I picked it up, my hand trembling. Hello, I managed, my voice barely above a whisper. You have to stop the noise, the voice cried out, now clearly desperate, please just make it stop. At that moment, a cold draft swept through the room, and the overhead light flickered violently. The temperature seemed to drop several degrees, and I felt a presence, an overwhelming sensation of grief and turmoil filling the room. It was as if the walls themselves were saturated with it. I dropped the phone, backing out of the room as the light steadied and the air warmed back to normal. I reported the incident to my manager, and after some deliberation, we decided to bring in a local historian who specialized in the town's past. He unearthed a troubling piece of history about the Meridian Hotel. Back in the 1930s, it turned out, room 404 had been the site of a tragic incident where a man had taken his own life after a series of financial ruin and personal losses. His death had been a hushed up scandal, forgotten as the hotel passed from one owner to another. After learning this, we held a small ceremony in room 404, bringing in a local clergy to bless the room and offer peace to any spirits that might be lingering. The calls stopped after that night. Room 404 was eventually renovated and turned into a small library for guests, a place of quiet and calm. I still work at the Meridian Hotel, and while nothing similar has happened since, I've never been able to shake the feeling when I pass by the old Room 404, a reminder of the night when the past reached out so urgently for comfort. In the fall of 2019, I started working night shifts at a small hostel in Charleston, South Carolina, a city known for its rich history and, some say, its lingering spirits. The hostel was an old building, repurposed many times over the centuries, currently housing travelers from all over the world. My job was simple man the front desk, help late arrivals check in, and ensure everything was quiet and secure through the night. One night in early October, the air had just begun to carry the crisp hint of autumn, and the hostel was quiet, with only a few guests checked in. The clock had just chimed 2 a.m., and I was settled behind the desk with a book to keep me company. That's when I first saw him, the man in the hall. He appeared suddenly, rounding the corner into the long corridor that led past the front desk. He was dressed in what looked like a Victorian-era suit, complete with a waistcoat and a bowler hat. His clothes were neat, but distinctly out of style, as if he'd walked out of a different era. He walked with purpose, his eyes fixed straight ahead, not even glancing at the front desk as he passed by. The sight of him was so unexpected, so out of place, that I stood up abruptly, knocking over my chair. But he didn't react. He just kept walking toward the far end of the corridor where it met the lobby wall. I watched, frozen, as he approached the wall and walked right through it. Be stunned, I ran to the spot where he had disappeared. I pressed my hands against the wall, half expecting them to pass through, but it was solid, unyielding. My heart was racing, my mind struggling to process what I had just seen. I knew every inch of this building, and there was certainly no door there not in this century, at least. Unable to shake off what I'd witnessed, I began poring over the hostel's records the next day. The building had indeed been many things over its long history of family home, a boarding school, even a speakeasy during Prohibition. Digging deeper, I found old architectural plans in the city archives. To my astonishment, there had been a door exactly where I'd seen the man disappear, but it had been bricked over during renovations in the early 1900s. The man's appearance began to haunt my nights at the hostel. I saw him several more times, always at 2 a.m., always walking the same path, and disappearing into the same wall. Each time I felt a chill in the air, a whisper of the past making itself known in the present. Driven by a mix of fear and curiosity, I reached out to a local historian who specialized in ghost tours. She was fascinated by my story and offered to hold a seance in the hostel. On a quiet night with the historian and a small group of brave guests, we gathered in the lobby near the wall where the man disappeared. The seance was unnerving. The air grew cold, and a palpable sense of anticipation filled the room. Then, just as the clock struck 2 a.m., the temperature dropped sharply. A soft, whispering voice filled the air, though I could not make out the words. It felt as though someone was standing just out of sight, watching us. After that night, the sighting stopped. 
Perhaps the seance had given the man some kind of peace, or maybe he had simply moved on. I continue to work at the hostel, and while I no longer see the man in the hall, I often feel a chill as I pass the spot where he used to disappear. It's a reminder that the past is never as far away as we think, and in Charleston history might be just around the corner or walking through the wall. Working late has always given me a weird thrill. The empty office, the quiet hum of machinery, it's creepy, sure, but it's also when I'm most productive. That's why on a chilly Thursday night in November 2020, I found myself alone on the 14th floor, the soft glow of my desk lamp and computer screen, the only light in a sea of cubicles. I was finishing up a major project for a client at the marketing firm where I work in downtown Minneapolis. Everyone else had long since gone home and I was in deep focus, headphones on, when the office printer suddenly whirred to life. The sound was startling in the otherwise silent office, and I remember feeling a prickle of annoyance, probably someone sending a print job to the wrong printer after hours. It wouldn't be the first time. I walked over to the printer, a bulky machine tucked away in a small, dimly lit room lined with filing cabinets. I expected to see some spreadsheets or a misdirected memo. Instead, what I found on the tray sent a chill down my spine. It was a photo of me sitting at my desk. Not just one photo, but several, each taken from different angles, none of which corresponded to any vantage points accessible in the office. In the photos, I looked up from my screen directly at the camera, clearly startled. But the most disturbing part was that these photos were taken just moments ago. How was this possible? Who was taking them? Panic set in, the isolation of the office, suddenly feeling more menacing than peaceful. I scanned the room for any sign of cameras, any indication of how these photos were taken, but found nothing. My mind raced with someone here with me, watching. I hurried back to my desk, grabbed my phone, and dialed security. The guard on duty, a guy named Ron, answered sleepily. I explained what had happened, my words tumbling out in a rush. He promised to come up and check it out, suggesting it might be a prank by one of my colleagues. But deep down, I knew it wasn't. The office was locked at night, and access was restricted to those with a key card. While waiting for Ron, I decided to check the printer's log, hoping it might reveal who sent the print job. But when I opened the menu, the log was empty, as though the printer had been reset. That was impossible, though, as the printer required a manager's code to alter its system settings. Ron arrived about 10 minutes later, flashlight in hand. We searched every inch of the 14th floor under desks, in closets, even the ceiling tiles, thinking maybe someone had hidden a camera there. But there was nothing. No cameras, no one hiding, nothing out of place. Ron suggested I head home, chalk it up to a technical glitch, or maybe fatigue making me see things. I packed up. The images of those photos burned into my mind. As I left, I turned off my desk lamp, casting one last look across the shadowy office. The silence felt heavy, loaded with unseen threats. Once home, I tried to rationalize what had happened, to convince myself it was all just a bizarre fluke. But sleep didn't come easy. Every shadow in my apartment made me jump. Every creak of the building settling sounded like footsteps. The next day, I returned to work, half dreading, stepping onto the 14th floor. As I approached my cubicle, I saw that everything was just as I'd left it. The printer was quiet, innocuous under the fluorescent lights. My colleagues greeted me, oblivious to the terror I'd felt the night before. But things were never quite the same after that. I started working earlier hours, avoiding being alone in the office late at night. Eventually, I requested a transfer to another department on a different floor. Sometimes I wonder if I'll ever understand what happened that night. Was it a ghost in the machine, some kind of digital haunting, or was there a more tangible explanation, one that remained just out of reach? The questions linger but perhaps some mysteries are better left unsolved. After all, not every story has a clear-cut ending, especially when shadows and technology blend in the quiet solitude of an office after dark. Working the graveyard shift at a secluded gas station on a deserted stretch of highway in rural Nevada, comes with its eerie moments. 
The desert is a quiet, eerie place at night where the winds whisper secrets of the barren landscape and the occasional traveler brings a brief respite from the overwhelming solitude. It was during one of these shifts in the winter of 2020 that I experienced something that still sends shivers down my spine when I think about it. The station was an old place, probably built in the 70s, and it had seen better days. The paint was peeling, the sign was faded, and the whole building creaked on windy nights. Right outside, there was an old payphone, a relic from a time before everyone had a cell phone in their pocket. It hadn't worked in years, the cord cut, and the receiver often dangling by a thread. It was more of a decoration at this point, a piece of the past that nobody bothered to remove. That night was particularly quiet, even by desert standards. No cars had passed in hours, and the only sounds were the occasional buzz of the neon sign and the distant howls of coyotes. I was stocking some shelves when the phone inside the station rang. Thinking it was just another trucker calling ahead for directions or to reserve a shower, I answered it without a second thought. Hello, Pete's Gas and Go. How can I help you? I said in my usual cheery tone, trying to sound more awake than I felt. Yeah, hi, I'm trying to find you guys. I think I took a wrong turn somewhere, a man's voice replied, sounding confused and a bit anxious. Sure thing, where are you at right now, I asked, ready to help guide him back to the main road. That's just it. I'm not sure. I saw your sign and I'm at the payphone outside. A chill ran through me. I instinctively glanced out the window to the payphone under the dim light of the gas station's front sign. It was as still as ever, untouched, the receiver hanging limply by its cord. There was no one there. I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Did you say you're at the payphone outside? I managed to stammer, my eyes not leaving the phone booth. Yeah, the one right outside your shop. Anyway, can you help me out? I don't see any lights or anything. Confused and more than a little frightened, I kept the caller on the line as I cautiously stepped outside, my hand resting on the door, just in case. The cold desert air bit at my skin as I approached the payphone, the caller still on the line, giving me what sounded like a play-by-play -play of exactly where I was standing. But as I reached the phone, the line went dead. The silence that followed was deafening. Heart pounding, I picked up the receiver, now suddenly cold in my hand. There was no dial tone, no static, nothing that would indicate the phone was working. As I hung it back up, the desert seemed to close in around me, the quiet more oppressive than ever. Was shaken, I hurried back inside, locking the door behind me. I watched from the window for what felt like hours until the sun began to rise, painting the desert in hues of orange and pink. No car ever arrived, no travelers seeking refuge or fuel. The next day, I asked my boss about the payphone, whether there was any chance it could have been operational. He just laughed, saying it hadn't worked in over a decade, and we'd be better off pulling it out of the ground. I nodded, not really sure what to make of the night's events. I never answered another call from that payphone again, but on some nights when the wind is just right, I swear I can hear the faint ringing of the phone over the howls of the coyotes and the whispering of the wind. Each time it reminds me of the vast, lonely stretches of the desert and the things that might be lurking just beyond the veil of darkness. Everything I'm about to tell you is true, and it haunts me to this day. Last winter, during a snowstorm so fierce it blurred the lines between night and day, I stayed late at the office to finish a project. The wind howled against the windows, a fitting soundtrack to the spreadsheet horror I faced. My office, a small, outdated space, sat isolated on what I always believed to be the top floor of a one-story building. It was nearing midnight, the eerie silence of the building punctuated only by my keystrokes and the occasional gust against the glass. That's when I heard it furniture scraping across a floor, directly above me. The distinct sound of heavy objects being dragged. It was methodical, deliberate, and it froze me in my chair. There's no office above mine, just an old, flat roof pelted by snow. Curiosity wrestled with fear until I stood up. The building was supposed to be empty, but there, above me, the dragging continued. I grabbed a flashlight from my drawer just in case the power went out and headed towards the narrow staircase at the end of the corridor, the one supposedly leading only to the roof. The air grew colder as I ascended, 
the sound above sharpening into chilling clarity. I paused at the top of the stairs, flashlight aimed at the door that led outside. The label read roof access. Emergency only. I hesitated, hand on the doorknob. The dragging sound stopped abruptly, as if aware of my proximity. I pushed the door open, the wind snatching it from my grip. Snow and darkness greeted me. The beam from my flashlight cut through the night, revealing nothing but the empty expanse of the rooftop. No footprints, no signs of disturbance in the fresh layer of snow. It just the relentless storm. As I turned to leave, convinced my mind was playing tricks, the noise resumed behind me but louder, more aggressive. I swung around, the light trembling in my hand. Nothing. There was absolutely nothing there that could make such a sound. The realization sent a shiver down my spine, colder than the wind biting at my skin. I hurried back downstairs, the sound of dragging now echoing in my ears. Once inside, I locked the door and rushed to my office, heart pounding as if trying to escape my chest. The building groaned under the weight of the storm, or perhaps something else. I gathered my things ready to leave when my phone rang. The display read unknown caller I answered hesitantly. Hello, my voice barely a whisper. Heavy breathing filled the line, then a deep, gravelly voice, why did you go up there? The line went dead. The question lingered in the air, palpable and menacing. I didn't wait around for anything else. I left the office, the sounds of moving furniture still audible as I exited the building. As I drove away, I watched the silhouette of the building recede in my rearview mirror, a shadow against the stormy backdrop. I've never returned to that office at night again, and I've moved my work to a different building since. But sometimes, when the wind is just right, I swear I can hear the faint echo of furniture moving on an empty rooftop, reminding me of that night. And the voice, that haunting question, never fails to chill my bones, why did you go up there? Everything I'm sharing is exactly as it happened, and thinking about it still sends shivers down my spine. I'm a mechanic, always have been. My shop is a small, two-bay garage in a quiet part of town, the kind where nothing much happens that is, until things started happening at my shop that I couldn't explain. It was a typical dreary Thursday when I first noticed something off. I had been working late on a particularly tricky clutch replacement, and I left my tools scattered around as I often do, after a long day. When I returned the next morning, everything was exactly where I'd left it, except the car was completely fixed, tools neatly arranged on the bench. At first I figured I'd finished the job and forgot about it. Maybe I was more tired than I thought. But then, it happened again. This time, it was an engine rebuild that needed doing. I planned to start on it first thing in the morning and left the parts laid out, manuals open on the workbench. When I unlocked the shop the next morning, there was the engine perfectly assembled, every tool back in its place. This time I was sure I hadn't touched it. The chill that ran down my spine wasn't just from the cold morning air. Curiosity overcame my initial shock, and I set up a camera to see what was happening at night. What it captured made my blood run cold. Around midnight, the shop seemed to come alive. Tools floated through the air, handled by invisible hands. Wrenches turned, screws tightened, and it all happened in complete silence, a silent orchestra of ghostly repairs. After seeing the footage, I was terrified, but also strangely mesmerized. I couldn't understand it, but part of me didn't want it to stop. It was, in a bizarre way, helping me out. So I left it be, didn't tell anyone, wondering if it might be a guardian angel of sorts. That was until the night I decided to stay late and see it for myself. Hiding in my office, lights off, I watched the clock tick toward midnight. As the minute hand aligned, a cold gust swept through the garage, though every door and window was shut tight. Then, the tools began to levitate, just as I'd seen on the video. A wrench hovered past me, and I followed it with my eyes, heart thumping in my chest. It moved with purpose, as if held by someone or something. Suddenly, the air thickened, and a figure slowly materialized at the workbench. It was vague and shadowy, barely human-shaped, focusing intensely on its task. I couldn't move, couldn't breathe. It must have felt my presence, because it stopped and turned toward me. There were no eyes, just dark hollows, but I felt it staring right into me, seeing me completely. I don't remember how long we stayed like that, locked in silence. 
It then turned back to its work, ignoring me and gradually faded out of view as the tools dropped to the floor. The cold gust was gone as quickly as it had appeared, and the normal sounds of the night returned. I left the shop immediately and didn't return until the sun was high in the sky. Everything was as it had been left fixed, cleaned, and eerily perfect. I couldn't work there anymore, not with what I knew. I sold the shop soon after, never telling the buyer about its nocturnal activities. To this day, I avoid driving past that old shop. Sometimes when I do, I swear I can see a faint light flickering inside, as if that midnight mechanic is still there, tirelessly working. Whatever it was, it never meant me harm, but knowing it was there was enough to turn my reality on its head. How many silent shadows linger where we least expect them, just beyond the veil of our understanding. Every detail of this account is as true and as unsettling as it was the night it happened. I work in a 24-hour call center that services a major telecom provider. Our office is in a nondescript building on the outskirts of town, the kind where the buzz of fluorescent lights is more constant than the foot traffic. We're the unseen voices behind the helpline, ghosts in the corporate machine, if you will. It was during one of those shifts that stretch into the early hours of the morning when the call came through. The clock had just blinked past 2 a.m., and the hum of activity had long since dwindled to a handful of us night owls. I remember the exact moment because I was nursing a lukewarm cup of coffee, trying to shake the chill that always seemed to hover in the air despite the heating. The phone line beeped, and I answered with the usual greeting, but the voice that came through was anything but usual. It was frail and slightly tremulous, the tone of someone uncertain if they wanted to be heard. Why has everyone forgotten me, she asked. I paused, thinking it was a prank or a confused caller. But then she said her name Marianne Wells, a name that meant nothing to me. I used to work here, at this call center. Why does no one remember her voice cracked? And there was a desperation there that gripped me. I muted the call for a moment, turning to look at Jerry, the only other person in my row. He shrugged when I mouthed the name Marianne Wells to him, and I unmuted the line. I'm sorry, but I don't recall anyone by that name. When did you work here? It's been, I think, five years now. I left for work one evening, and I never made it home. I just... Nobody seems to remember me the next day, or any days after her words sent a shiver through me. It sounded like the setup to one of those urban legends or a ghost story, the kind you half believe as a kid. Intrigued and unnerved, I promised to check the employee records. I put her on hold, my hands shaking slightly as I logged into the digital archives. Typing in the name, Marianne Wells brought up a file, last modified over five years ago. It was indeed an employee record. There was her photo, staring back at me a woman in her early thirties, brown-haired, with a kind smile that didn't reach her sad eyes. Jerry came over, curious about my pale face. I showed him the screen, and he frowned. I think I remember her. And vaguely. Didn't she go missing? Returning to the call, I found only static. Marianne was gone. I tried radioing the number, but it came up as disconnected. We called the police, and I gave them all the information we had. They took it seriously, reopening a cold case that none of us knew existed. It turns out Marianne Wells had indeed vanished without a trace five years ago. Her case had gone cold, her desk cleared out, her life quietly packed away into a file on a forgotten hard drive. The police never found her nor did they receive any more calls. But I remember her. Sometimes when the clock strikes 2 a.m. and the building falls silent save for the buzz of those unyielding fluorescent lights, I wonder if Marianne is still out there, trying to find her way back, trying to make someone remember. It's not just the chill that makes me shudder now when I sip my coffee in those quiet, small hours. It's the thought of being forgotten, erased so completely, and the echoing question of a lost soul, why has everyone forgotten me, it haunts me, and I do my best to remember her, hoping it's enough.
Let me tell you something I experienced, something that still tightens my chest with fear when I think about it. I worked as a night cleaner in one of those sprawling corporate buildings you see rising like glass mountains in the business district. It was a solitary job, just me and the silent hum of vacuums and the echo of my own footsteps after everyone else had gone home. This particular building was newer, gleaming with all manner of steel and glass, but at night it took on a different character. Shadows stretched longer than the day's patience, and sounds had a way of playing tricks on you. I'd been warned by my predecessor, a wiry old man with more wrinkles than teeth, to wear headphones while working. Keeps the heebie-jeebies away, he had said with a knowing look. I laughed it off. I shouldn't have. It started subtly, the soft echo of footsteps behind me as I mopped the floors. I'd turn around, nothing there but the flicker of the overhead lights reflecting off the polished surfaces. I told myself it was just echoes, my own steps bouncing back at me from the cavernous, empty halls. But the sound didn't sync with my movements, it was slightly off, as if some someone was indeed following, trying to match their steps with mine but not quite keeping up. One night, things escalated. It was around 2.30 a.m., and I was cleaning the executive floor, an area with more plush carpets than the rest of the floors. It should have muffled any steps, my own included. But there they were, louder than ever, unhurried, deliberate footsteps echoing through the halls. I stopped, turned around nothing. The silence that followed was almost suffocating. I gathered my nerves and continued, faster now, wanting only to finish my rounds. I was vacuuming near the corner office when I saw it a shadow flitting across the wall, just at the edge of my vision. It wasn't mine I was standing still, and this shadow moved with purpose. I turned off the vacuum, the sudden silence feeling heavy. Hello, my voice was met with the mute indifference of empty air and distant walls. That's when I heard a whisper, a sigh, almost brushing against my ear. I spun around, my heart slamming against my ribs, only to meet emptiness. But there in front of me on the carpet were wet footprints, a pair of them, as clear as day, leading away into the dark corridor and stopping abruptly. I followed the footprints against my better judgment. They led to the stairwell, disappearing as if whoever or whatever made them had simply vanished into thin air. Standing there, at the top of the dark stairwell, I felt a chill that went deeper than bone. It wasn't just the idea of being followed anymore, it was the unnerving realization that whatever was with me in that building wasn't alive. After that night, I couldn't bring myself to work there anymore. I handed in my notice the next day, offering no explanation to my bewildered boss. What could I say? That the building was haunted? That I feared for my sanity if I stayed any longer? I left that job, but the memory of those footsteps and the inexplicable coldness of the air in that stairwell never left me. Sometimes, late at night in the quiet of my own home, I pause and listen, half expecting to hear the echo of those footsteps again. They say some experiences stay with you, etched into your mind, and this one certainly has. It's a chilling reminder that sometimes, just sometimes, you might not be as alone as you think. Working overnight shifts at an airport might sound boring, but let me tell you, it's anything but that. I've always enjoyed the peace of the night, fewer flights, less hustle. That was until one particular shift changed everything for me. This happened a few months ago. I was stationed at the international terminal of an old airport, not the busiest, but with enough traffic to keep you on your toes. Around 3 a.m., things generally quiet down until the early morning flights begin. That night, the fog had rolled in thick, swallowing the runway lights and giving everything an eerie, muffled quality. It was just me and a handful of security personnel, the echoes of our steps blending with the distant hum of the HVAC system. I was doing the usual rounds, checking gates, ensuring everything was set for the first morning departures. As I passed by gate 14, the PA system crackled to life. It was an announcement for final boarding at gate 14, but not just any flight, flight 401 to Miami, which would have been completely ordinary if it hadn't been for one chilling detail flight. 401 crashed into the Everglades back in the 70s, a tragic event caused by a technical failure. I froze the hairs on the back of my neck standing on end. The flight number and destination were unmistakable. The announcement repeated, this time urging, last call for passengers boarding flight 401 at gate 14. Confused and admittedly scared, I approached the gate. 
The screens which should have been displaying the details for the next day's flight to Toronto were off. Gate 14 was deserted, shrouded more in silence than in fog. I grabbed the nearest airport phone and dialed into the central control to report what was happening. No flight scheduled for gate 14 until 6 a.m., Toronto bound the tired voice on the other end confirmed. And definitely no flight 400 when I hung up, my gaze locked on the empty gate. The announcement stopped as abruptly as it had started, leaving a pressing silence. Driven by a mix of duty and dread, I decided to check the sound system's log in the operations room. Maybe it was a technical glitch, or a prank though the idea of a prank in such a setting seemed profoundly in poor taste. The logs showed nothing unusual until I reached the entries for the night. There was in black and white an activation recorded for the PA system at gate 14, exactly when I heard the announcements. But the source was untraceable. It was as if the system had activated itself, or someone had done it remotely without leaving a digital footprint. I reported this to my supervisor, who was as baffled as I was. We agreed to keep it under wraps, at least until we understood more. I went home that morning with the sunrise casting long shadows over the tarmac, unable to shake the chill that had settled deep in my bones. Over the next few weeks, I conducted my own research. I learned that after the crash of Flight 401, parts of the wrecked aircraft had been salvaged and reused in other planes. There were stories, urban legends really, of sightings and unexplained phenomena on those flights, lights flickering, ghostly apparitions, and even voices heard in empty cabins. The airline had eventually removed all the salvaged parts, but the stories persisted. I never heard the announcement again, nor did anything else out of the ordinary happen on my shifts. But sometimes when the fog rolls in thick and the night is at its darkest, I find myself listening intently over the sound of my own breathing, half expecting to hear the ghostly call for final boarding to a destination reached only in tragedy. It's a stark reminder of the thin veil between past and present and how, perhaps, some remnants of the past refuse to be forgotten. Working alone at night in a floral shop might seem like a dream job for some, especially in a quaint little town where everyone knows your name. But there's something about that shop, something chilling, that no amount of warm, fragrant blooms can mask. I started working there last spring, eager for the tranquility it promised, surrounded by rows of tulips, daisies, and vibrant roses. The odd occurrences began just a few weeks into my tenure. The shop, a charming yet aging building, had an air of mystery its wooden floors creaked with every step, and the dim lighting never quite reached the corners. Each evening as I prepared to close, a potent smell of roses would fill the air. It wasn't the gentle fragrance that lingered during the day, but an overpowering, almost suffocating rush of scent. I mentioned this to my boss once, but she just chuckled and shrugged it off as a quirk of an old building storing thousands of flowers. But one night, the phenomenon escalated. It was a quiet Tuesday, with the rain tapping gently against the window panes. As I was organizing the back storage room, the scent of roses grew so intense it made my head spin. That's when I saw her for the first time. Through the doorway leading to the main shop floor, I caught a glimpse of a figure a woman, draped in a dark, flowing gown. She moved with grace, her hands delicately arranging the bouquets on the counter. I stood frozen, watching her. It wasn't just the sight of someone else in the shop that startled me, it was the way she seemed to be part of the shadows, her edges blurred and shimmering. Curiosity overcame my fear, and I stepped closer, the floorboards creaking under my weight. She didn't acknowledge me. As I approached, the air grew colder, the scent of roses so strong it was almost visible in the air like a mist. I reached out to tap her shoulder, but just as my hand was about to make contact, she vanished. The scent dissipated with her, leaving behind only the faint, usual smell of mixed flowers. Shaken, I left the shop earlier than usual, locking up while glancing over my shoulder. At home, I tried convincing myself it was a trick of the light or my imagination fueled by the isolation of the shop. But as the nights went on, she returned again and again. Each sighting followed the same pattern, the overwhelming scent of roses, her silent arranging of flowers, and her disappearance whenever I tried to get too close. Driven by a mix of fear and a need for answers, I decided to research the history of the shop. 
The local library held old newspapers and records, and that's where I found her Isabella, the original owner of the floral shop from the early 1900s. I filmed her black and white portrait, and the newspaper sent a chill down my spine she was the woman I had seen. The article detailed her tragic life she had died young, under mysterious circumstances, her love for her shop, and the roses she adored marking her legacy. Now, knowing who she might be, I felt a strange sort of peace. Each night as the scent of roses grew strong, I'd see her there, tending to the flowers with a silent dedication. I stopped trying to approach her, respecting this spectral routine as her way of maintaining a presence in the world she couldn't leave behind. I worked there still, and the encounters continue. Some nights I even bring roses just for her, setting them out before I leave. They're always arranged differently by morning. Whether this is a genuine haunting or a figment of my isolation, it doesn't scare me anymore. If anything, I see it as a connection to the past, to the history of the little shop that is my refuge. And sometimes, just sometimes, I think I catch a glimpse of approval in the shadows. A thank you from a woman who devoted her life to the beauty of flowers, bound forever to the scent of roses. I used to work as a switchboard operator for a small communications company that, due to its financial constraints, still used some antiquated equipment. The switchboard I operated wasn't as old-fashioned as the ones from the early 1900s, but it had its quirks and a fair share of wires and plugs. My shifts often ran through the night, which suited me just fine because I liked the quiet. The nights were usually uneventful, filled with routine calls and the occasional emergency patch through. But everything changed one stormy night in late September. It was around 2 a.m. and a thunderstorm was raging outside. The office was located on the outskirts of town and the old building creaked and moaned under the strain of the wind. Rain lashed against the small barred windows. I was nursing a strong cup of coffee when the switchboard lit up. A call was coming through on one of the lines that rarely saw any activity at night. I answered in my usual manner, but there was a slight pause before anyone responded. When the caller did speak, his voice sounded crackly and distant, as if transmitted over vast distances. Operator, could you connect me to Juniper 2157, please? The voice asked. His tone was polite, but carried an urgency that seemed out of place. Juniper 2157? I'm sorry, sir, but that's not a valid code. Could you check the number I responded? puzzled because the numbering format he used was obsolete, not used since the 1960s. No, young lady, that is the number. Please, it's urgent, he insisted, his voice growing fainter, as if fading. Chalking it up to some prank, or a confused old man, I tried to explain that such a number didn't exist anymore, but he abruptly hung up. Shaking my head, I went back to my coffee. Minutes later, another call came through, this time a woman asking to be connected to a number that also hadn't been used in decades. Her voice was anxious, and she mentioned she needed to speak with her son, who was fighting overseas a war that had ended long before I was born. I felt a chill run down my spine, but again, the line went dead before I could say anything more. The calls kept coming, each one requesting connections to old, Unused numbers, each caller claiming to be calling from the past different eras, different stories, but all and possibly out of time. The voices were filled with desperation and confusion, and the storm outside seemed to intensify with each call. He frightened, I finally reached out to my manager on duty, waking him from his makeshift bed in the back room. As I explained the situation, the switchboard went silent, the storm abruptly stopped, and everything seemed unnaturally still. My manager, groggy and skeptical, suggested it might be an issue with the lines due to the storm, perhaps crossed wires or some electrical interference playing tricks. However, when we checked the recordings the next day, there were no records of the calls, no traces of the voices pleading for connections to a time long past, nothing to prove I hadn't imagined the entire ordeal. My manager joked about it being the result of too much caffeine or a half dream nightmare as I dozed off but I know what I heard. Every once in a while when the weather turns and the wind howls just right, the switchboard lights up. I hesitate, watching it flicker, half expecting to hear those voices from the past, asking for connections to a time and place that no longer exists. It's a reminder, perhaps, that some lines shouldn't be crossed, 
or maybe just a testament to the echoes we leave behind echoes, that sometimes find their way back through the wires, no matter how old or frayed they might be. I run a record shop in a neighborhood that's seen better days. The place is a relic stacked with vinyl that spans decades, nestled between a closed-down diner and a pawn shop. It's the kind of shop you might see in a movie, where each record holds a story and the dust is part of the decor. I've been managing it for a few years now, mostly running the night shift, because that's when the real collectors come out those looking for something rare when the world is quiet. One night, things started off like any other. I was cataloging some new arrivals in the back when I heard a faint crackle over the sound system. Assuming I'd left a record playing, I walked over to the turntable in the front. It was empty, nothing spinning, but the music was still playing, a soft, melancholy tune that seemed oddly familiar yet completely unplaceable. I checked the other turntables. There are three in the shop for customers to preview records. All were empty. I figured it must be a glitch in the wiring, a crossed signal from some other electrical device. But as I bent down to check the connections, the music grew louder and a voice came over the speakers. It wasn't part of any song I'd ever heard it, was as if someone was speaking directly through the turntable. Please, can you help me? The voice whispered, barely above the crackle that filled the background. The plea was so soft, so desperate, that it froze me in place. I stood up and scanned the shop, half expecting to find someone hiding among the aisles of records. No one was there, just me and the endless rows of music history. The voice continued, repeating the plea over and over, growing more agitated. Please help me, I can't get out. At this point, I was thoroughly spooked, but also strangely captivated. I started to search through the piles of records, trying to determine if the voice was coming from one of them somehow. Maybe a joke record or a hidden track I wasn't aware of. As I searched, the music shifted, the melody twisting into something darker. I found the source on a shelf that held some of the oldest records in the shop. It was an unmarked, dusty vinyl placed back from the edge, as if someone had tried to hide it. Hesitant but needing to know, I placed it on the main turntable and dropped the needle. The music that poured out was the same haunting tune I had been hearing, and the voice came again, clearer this time. Thank you for listening, but please, can you find me? I'm still here. The room felt colder, the shadows deeper. I took the record off, packed it away in the back room, and decided that was enough cataloging for one night. I couldn't shake the voice from my mind, though it had sounded so real, so urgent. Curiosity overcame fear the next day, and I did some digging. The shop's records were as old as old as the building, passed down from owner to owner. I found a faded journal tucked away beneath the register, the entries dating back to the original owner. There, written in shaky script, was a mention of the record. The entry was vague, but mentioned a tragic tale in a voice that shouldn't be there recorded by accident during a live session in the shop itself, back when such things were common. The owner at the time had thought it best to keep the record, fearing what might happen if it was destroyed. According to the journal, he believed the voice belonged to a young woman who went missing in the neighborhood decades ago, never found. He wrote that he thought the record captured something else, something not entirely of this world. I've listened to it several more times since then, each time the police sounding more distressed. I can't bring myself to get rid of it or to ignore it. I've started researching missing persons from the area, from the time before the shop even existed, trying to piece together who she might have been. Now, late at night when the shop is quiet and the streets outside are empty, I play the record for whoever might listen, hoping that maybe, just maybe, the right person will hear it and know what to do. Maybe then, the voice can find some peace, and the shadows in the shop will feel a little less deep. But until then, the plea continues, a ghostly echo in the grooves of an old vinyl, asking for help, that I don't know how to give. Everything I'm about to share feels utterly real, and each detail is etched deeply into my mind. I was working as a night janitor in an old theater downtown, a place with a rich history that stretched back over a century. This theater, once bustling with the noise of crowds and the grandeur of performances, had seen better days. 
Now, it mostly hosted small, local shows, and by night, it transformed into something else entirely something, almost otherworldly. The phenomenon started my first week on the job. I was briefed about the usual where the cleaning supplies were, what areas needed the most attention, and more jokingly, to not let the ghosts bother me. I laughed, assuming it was just a way to lighten the mood. However, I wasn't prepared for what came next. Each night at exactly midnight, the silence of the empty theater was shattered by the sound of applause loud, thunderous, lasting for about a minute, then fading as suddenly as it began. The first time I heard it, I was polishing the wooden handrails that lined the aisles of the main auditorium. The clapping echoed through the halls, so clear and precise, that I thought a performance had let out without me noticing. I rushed into the auditorium, my heartbeat sinking with each echo I chased. But the vast space was empty. No audience, no performers, just rows of red velvet seats basking under the faint glow of the exit signs. Puzzled and admittedly shaken, I returned to my tasks, telling myself it was just some acoustical quirk of the old building. But it happened again the next night, and every night thereafter. Always at midnight, always the same duration, and always ending abruptly. I started to dread the approach of midnight, the anticipation twisting in my gut each night as the clock neared twelve. Curiosity and a burgeoning obsession led me to search for answers. I scoured local archives for any clues about past events in the theater that might explain the mysterious applause. That's when I stumbled upon a faded program from the 1920s for a show that was a smash hit in its time. Intrigued, I dug deeper and discovered a chilling detail. The leading actress, a star renowned for her beauty and talent, had her final performance in this very theater. The night had ended in tragedy, a stage accident had occurred, claiming her life at precisely midnight during the grand finale, the moment of peak applause. Armed with this knowledge, the nightly applause took on a new, sinister meaning. It was as if the theater itself was reliving that final moment of glory and tragedy, trapped in a perpetual loop. The realization unsettled me deeply, transforming my nightly chores into a walk through a haunted replay that I could neither participate in nor alter. Driven by a mix of fear and a need for closure, I decided to face the phenomenon head on. As midnight approached one evening, I stood center stage, the spotlights off, the auditorium shrouded in darkness. The clock struck twelve and the applause rolled in like a wave. This time, I clapped along, an attempt to connect with whatever remnants of the past lingered in the air. To my astonishment, amidst the clapping, I heard a faint, feminine voice singing a haunting melody that seemed to seep from the very walls. The song was melancholic, filled with longing and sorrow, fading as the applause died. I stood there in the dark, alone yet surrounded by the echoes of a century's past. I never heard the applause again after that night. Perhaps it was my participation in the ritual, or maybe the spirit of the theater had found the acknowledgement it needed to rest. I continued working there for a while longer, always respectful of the space and its history, always listening for a song that never came again. The theater eventually closed down, unable to keep up with modern entertainment demands. But my nights there, particularly those echoing with applause and song, remain vivid in my memory, a haunting performance for an audience of one. In 2019, I landed a job as a security monitor for a large, somewhat dilapidated shopping mall on the outskirts of town. The job was straightforward, watch the cameras, report incidents, and keep the nightly log books up to date. The mall had seen better days, with more than half of the stores vacant and the remaining ones clinging on for dear life. It wasn't exactly bustling, but it had its share of late night visitors and minor vandalism, enough to keep my shifts from being completely dull one night a few months into the job, I noticed something odd on one of the screens. It was a flash of a scene that didn't belong a brief snippet of what looked like a birthday party in a brightly lit backyard. I blinked, and it was gone, replaced again by the gray, empty hallway of the mall. At first I thought it was a glitch, or maybe I was more tired than I realized. But then it happened again, a different camera showing a different scene. This time, it was a family dinner, the kind of warm, festive gathering I hadn't been to in years. Puzzled, I started checking the system, wondering if somehow our feeds were picking up a signal or broadcast 
from somewhere else. But the wiring was as it should be, and the tech support assured me everything was functioning normally. It was when the third clip popped up, an image of a playground I recognized from my own childhood, that a chill ran down my spine. That playground was in a small town two states over, where I had grown up a place none of these cameras should have been able to reach. As these glimpses continued to appear, I realized they were showing me scenes from my own life moments I had completely forgotten. It was surreal, watching fragments of my past play out on a screen in a dark, lonely security office. Each clip was brief, no more than a few seconds, but each was deeply personal. A Christmas morning when I was seven, my grandfather teaching me to ride a bike, a high school graduation party, it felt invasive, as though someone had rifled through my memories and selected highlights to display. I didn't tell anyone at first. I mean, how could I explain it? That the security cameras in a nearly abandoned mall were showing me my own past instead of the present. Who would believe that? It sounded absurd, the kind of story you'd expect in a sci-fi novel, not in real life. Compelled to understand what was happening, I started spending my shifts watching more intently. I cataloged each occurrence, noting the time, the camera, and the memory it showed. The more I watched, the more unnerving it became. These were moments I hadn't just forgotten, they were moments I wasn't sure had ever actually happened. Memories that felt both real and imagined. Determined for answers, I dove into the mall's history, searching for anything that could explain these phenomena. It turned out the site had once been a residential area before being cleared for commercial development. Further digging revealed that my childhood home had stood approximately where the mall was built. The revelation hit me like a ton of bricks, was I somehow tapping into the past, into a layer of time that still resonated beneath the concrete and steel? The occurrences never lasted long and were sporadic, but each one left me more rattled than the last. I started feeling watched, as though by revealing these clips, something or someone was observing my reactions, gauging my responses. After a particularly vivid clip that replayed a forgotten summer afternoon with a friend who had moved away and lost touch, I couldn't take it anymore. I resigned from my position, citing personal reasons. Leaving that job felt like stepping back into reality from a strange, parallel existence where time and memory intersected in impossible ways. To this day, I'm still unsure of what caused those images to appear. Was it a trick of the mind, or had something within the mall's network accessed my deepest memories? I still look over my shoulder sometimes, half expecting to see a familiar scene from my past flickering in the reflection of a window or mirror, but nothing has happened since I left. That part of my life feels like a dream now, one that I'm not eager to revisit.